Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Kreitis. Today is Monday, July 29th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. So today we're going to pretty much focus our attention on the Federal Reserve and on the stock market today because, again, as we were stating yesterday on our week ahead, look ahead, this is a very crazy moment in time. But it's also one that is very interesting. This is one for the history books. We are always in the midst of history, but this is really something else. The entire globe is awaiting what Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve has to say on Wednesday afternoon. The markets were a little moved today. We're going to get to that. What are they going to do? Are they going to cut rates? Are they going to end quantitative tightening? Are they going to announce that they're going to end it? Are they going to end it? You know, take the time to go on capitalnews.com, thecapitalnews.com, or our YouTube channel, also the Capital News, because I did take the time to post a video talking about the central bank, and the video is titled, Are Central Banks Trapped? I think they are. We talk about this here all the time. But I wanted to show you guys visually what I look at when the focus of that presentation was on the balance sheet with a focus on the asset side of the ledger for the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan. The ECB had a meeting last week. They signaled that they are ready to prime the press, that they are ready to go even deeper into negative interest rate territory that they are ready to also embark on another round of quantitative easing. We have the Bank of Japan meeting this week. We have the Bank of England meeting this week. Obviously, we have the Federal Reserve meeting this week. We know the Bank of Japan always stands at the ready to prime their presses and to print as much Japanese yen as possible. They are also one of the largest owners of Japanese equities. You can't make this stuff up, folks. They have been stagnating for the past 30 years. Is that the way the United States is going to go? I hope not. I don't want it to. But when you listen to Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve and other members of the Federal Reserve Board, whether or not they are voting members or not this term, they get to voice their opinions. They get to give speeches. They get to give interviews. And most of them are lock in, are lock and step to continue with this next easing cycle that I think we are going to be in the midst of. Why? Because they're trapped. They've trapped themselves. Because there was no return to any type of quote-unquote normalcy with respect to interest rates. We were at the zero bound for several years. We embarked on quantitative easing. And when you take the time, and I hope you do, take the time to check out thecapitalnews.com or go on YouTube and watch this video because we only focus on one graph. And when you actually see what quantitative easing looks like, you're going to scratch your head and say, these guys don't know what they're doing. It becomes that evident that quickly. There is nothing normal here. There is nothing sane here. This is a grand global monetary experiment that is not going to end well. It has not even been working well for the vast majority of the population on this planet, let alone the United States of America, on this planet. It has been a massive wealth transfer from the lower echelons of the income scale to the upper echelons of the income scale. It's exactly what it is. Because the vast majority of people on this planet do not own financial assets. Whether that's stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, you name it. Most people don't own. They rent, they live paycheck to paycheck. They borrow, they lease. There's not a lot of ownership here. That's why you have these crazy statistics that we were talking about yesterday. 1% of the world's population owns 90-some percent of the world's wealth. This is why there is rise of nationalism and populism the world over. People know something's wrong. And something is wrong. And graphically, you see that front and center on our presentation. This is what money printing does. 
Now, you can have it, you know, these central bankers are going to come out and say, well, we're well-intentioned. We have everything under control. All this is, ladies and gentlemen, is a false sense of security. We, as human beings, have placed these institutions into positions of power for nothing more than a false sense of security. Just if it gets a little bumpy, we get to say, oh, well, we're going to look at that institution over there because we got together and we put the smartest people on it to get the smartest people who can handle these bumps along the road. This is all nonsense. This is all a bedtime story. So you can fall asleep and feel better about yourself. But this is, it's, it's fake. It's a facade. It's a false sense of security. We don't need these institutions. Well, we just need somebody at the wheel. Well, they are at the wheel. They're drunk. They're intoxicated. And they don't know what they're doing. Does that sound like a strong sense of security to you? Check out that graph. You're going to be shocked. And just, and just wait and see the direction of where the, that graph goes over the course of the next year or two. Because we are predicting here that it is going to be off to the races once again. We are going to see interest rate cuts the world over, and we are most likely going to see another round of quantitative easing coming from major central banks the world over. And also smaller central banks, emerging market economies. This is going to be global. So nobody's safe. The world is going to be awash in liquidity even more than what it already is. Although, depending on what market you're talking about, sometimes there's a little bit of a scare with liquidity. I mean, that's sort of the double-edged sword here, the environment we're living in, because we had that massive sell-off back in December of 2018. That was because of a liquidity crunch or the threat of liquidity leaving the system. That was the hissy fit. That will happen again, and it will be even worse, in my opinion. I could be wrong. Always admit that I could be wrong. But my analysis, history repeating itself in some course, it's not going to be pretty. So the S&P lost five points today. The Dow gained 29. The Nasdaq lost 37. And the Russell 2000 lost 10 points, a decline of six-tenths of 1%. The Dow Jones Transport was flat. And the New York Stock Exchange was also flat. So again, these markets were flat, waiting on pins and needles to see what happens on Wednesday in regards to the Federal Reserve's decision. Oil fluctuated a little bit back and forth today. Some, you know, it all speculation. It's all headline news. It's all a bunch of mumbo jumbo. Is it supply and demand? Is there Mideast tensions, geopolitical events? What's the scare? What's the news? But WTI is trading at $57 and change, and Brent crude is trading at $64 and change at the time of this podcast. Gold is trading at $1,423 an ounce. Silver remains above 16 and is trading at $16.45 an ounce. Uncle Sam's 10-year treasury was down a little bit today and is now yielding 2.06%. There are some analysts coming out on the financial mainstream media projecting that the 10-year treasury bill is going to zero. We're at 2.06%. We have analysts out there saying it's going to zero. It's quite possible, ladies and gentlemen. I wouldn't be surprised because when you look at other major economies around the world, if you even want to call any economy a major economy anymore, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all funny money. I mean, you're talking about Germany. You're talking about France, Switzerland, Japan. Negative rates. Negative rates. Okay, and we're going to have a brief discussion on that update too. The VIX, the volatility index, gained 5.5% and is now trading at $12.83 pennies. A couple of things to note before we get into some of the other topics here today. Natural gas prices hit a three-year low. Now, it was only a couple weeks ago. They were really off to the races with all that heat wave and everything. The demand really picked up for natural gas. But now it's the complete reversal. You know, one day is not a trend, but we have natural gas hitting a three-year low. Now, you don't just look at this in isolation, ladies and gentlemen, because you have to connect all of the dots, all of the things that we talk about here on the Capital News Podcast, because front and center, and one of the things that we've had multiple discussions about, is the corporate debt load. What we've also had multiple conversations about are junk bonds, 
the corporate bond market, bonds that are rated triple B, one step ahead of junk status. A lot of these companies, whether they're already marked as junk or whether they still have the triple B status rating, a lot of these companies are in the energy sector. It's a capital intensive endeavor. There's no guarantee of success. So you get those types of ratings. Now, if you have lower prices, you might have a problem, especially in the backdrop of slowing global demand. You get my drift here? If these companies start to miss their debt payments, what are they going to do? Or if they start struggling to make their debt payments because they're not yielding a higher price on the market, what are they going to do? Are they going to default? Are they going to start laying off workers massively? Are they going to start selling off assets? What are they going to do? Because these are contracts. And one of the things, I don't necessarily know if this is going to be a catalyst to kickstart this next major downturn, but it's definitely going to be a huge domino that has huge ripple effects down the line. And that's going to be once these rating agencies have no choice but to lift the curtain, remove the veil, and say, you know what, a lot of these companies that we've rated and have rated, triple B, they're now junk. And just because of that very downgrade amongst a slew of companies across multiple sectors and industries, just simply by the way the investment side of things works, where you're going to have ma major mutual funds and other investment funds who cannot hold junk. They cannot hold it by their own charters. So they have to sell. It's going to be a massive sell-off. Okay, so you're going to have a huge problem. You're going to have a huge liquidity crisis, and you're going to have a big problem. You're going to have uh, rates increasing on companies that already can't afford what they're already dealing with. So this can get nasty and out of hand extremely quickly. And I do believe central banks are aware of this. And I think this is one of the key reasons why they are now tilting and going forward with lowering interest rates, and they are going to embark on another easing cycle. And you have to keep in mind, too, folks, and we're going to have visual video presentations on this as well as we make our way through, but when you have a central bank, and primarily here we're talking about the Federal Reserve, when you have them go from a hiking cycle to a wait-and-see mode, which we've been witnessing since December, so for seven, almost eight months now, to a cutting cycle, you're pretty much almost guaranteeing a recession. Now, it's already the fact that we've had low interest rates for an extremely long amount of time and quantitative easing. That was the problem. All of that mess was always going to cause the next downturn. What it needed to really sort of prick the bubble was an increase in interest rates. This was inevitable. This was going to happen one way or the other. It was either going to happen by the Federal Reserve doing it because they've been at the lower bound for so long that they said, well, you know, recessions aren't outlawed. Um, you know, this is one of our key tools as monetary policy experts. Uh, we better get these interest rates back up somewhat because if we do turn down again, we're going to need some ammunition. So they started to increase interest rates, also trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. But again, if you look at that presentation, are central banks trapped? And you look at quantitative easing, you look at how it plateaus, you look at how they began quantitative tightening, removing liquidity from the system, and you look at where they've barely done anything. We are still trillions and trillions of dollars uh, in, in bonds, in, in uh, mortgage-backed securities that are sitting on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. We're, we're nowhere near normal. And when I say normal, I'm talking going back 2007, 2008, 2009 levels. We're not even close, folks. And it's going the opposite direction here very shortly. They're going to put the pedal to the metal because that's what they do. That's what they do. So this whole thing with natural gas, we got to pay attention to these natural gas prices. Same thing with the price of oil. That's why we talk about it here every day because this has implications for these companies. It was only a few years ago where you had a big rut in the energy market. A lot of companies going bankrupt, a lot of them getting bought out. There was a, li a, a little mini recession amongst the energy companies only a handful of years ago. 
They got saved because we were still in the midst of quantitative easing, lower interest rates. There were some private equity and some other companies that came in to swoop them up and to save them. I don't think there's going to be an appetite to come in and save these companies this time around. Again, I could be wrong, but that's my analysis on it. Now, I also want to talk about the president, Donald Trump, because as we predicted just yesterday, the president was going to be taking to Twitter, which of course is no surprise to anybody, but he was once again going to attack the Federal Reserve, which we said he would do. It was likely that he would do this this week because this has been the president's M.O., especially during a week when the Federal Reserve meets to set interest rates because the Federal Reserve is in a blackout period. They cannot come out and rebut the president. They're not going to come out and say anything pretty much anyway, but this is just open game for Donald Trump right now to take to Twitter, press conference, whatever he wants to do to bash the Fed because they're not going to say anything during this window, this blackout period. So he made a few tweets today. I'll read a couple of them to you. The first one here, the EU, the European Union, and China will further lower interest rates and pump money into their systems, making it much easier for their manufacturers to sell product. In the meantime, and with very low inflation, our Fed does nothing and probably will do very little by comparison. Too bad! Exclamation point. So we're going to do some analysis on the president's statements. But he had another one. The Fed raised way too early and way too much. Their quantitative tightening was another big mistake. While our country is doing very well, the potential wealth creation that was missed, especially when measured against our debt, is staggering. We are competing with other countries that know how to play the game against the U.S. That's actually why the EU was formed, and for China, until now, the U.S. has been easy pickings. The Fed has made all of the wrong moves. A small rate cut is not enough, but we will win anyway! Exclamation point. So, a couple of things I want to take issue here with the president's tweets. So, the first thing, again, and this I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but as, as long as the president's going to sound like a broken record, I'm going to have to sound like a broken record to defend free market capitalism and the foundations and fundamentals of this country because the president wants to continuously point to the socialists of Europe and the communists of China and tells and is trying to instruct our Federal Reserve to adopt the same policies. I thought I heard the president say in his State of the Union address and several times over since then, because that was all the way back in February, that this country will never be a socialist nation. So why is it, Mr. President, that you want us to follow the socialists of Europe and the communists in China? And sometimes he throws in Japan, which has been stagnant for 30 years. So th this is a head-scratcher to me. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. He has to answer that question. Because the other thing that he says in here is that lowering the interest rates, again, he wants to talk about a weaker dollar, will make the, our manufacturers more competitive, sell more product. The problem is the United States is not a net exporter. We import more than we export. That's why it is a drag on our GDP. Now, can it turn around? Can we become a net exporter? Sure, we could, but this isn't going to happen with the flip of a switch. It's most definitely not going to happen in this environment where we have trade wars all over the place, where we have threats of trade wars all over the place, when we have threats of real wars in a couple parts of the world. We still got the mess in Venezuela. We still have the saber rattling with Iran. We talk about these topics all the time. There's too much uncertainty. We know for a fact that the global economy is slowing down. So where is all of the capital expenditure going to go? What are, they going, what are these companies supposedly going to invest in here in the United States? Will the tax cuts remain in place? Will the deregulations remain in place? Or is it just inevitable some point in the future that a Democrat will become the president, that, a dem that the Democrats may regain control of both the House and the Senate? And those things, taxes, regulations, and a whole slew of other things, are going to come into question. Do you think companies are just going to sit there and say, oh yeah, let's just bring everything back here to the United States so we can continue to manufacture our goods here? Meanwhile, they're going to have to pay an arm and a leg higher for labor and wages and benefits and a whole slew of other things. 
it's just not a good recipe right now. I applaud the president for wanting to grow this economy, but this is not the manner in which to do it by weakening the value of the U.S. dollar. In the meantime, it'll just simply cause the price of everything to go up. So you think that's going to help you out? I mean, the president says no inflation's a good thing. Why is he trying to generate inflation then? Because that ex is exactly what would take place if you have an even weaker dollar. It simply screws the middle class over, which is pretty much his base. So I don't know why he would be doing such a thing, advocating for such a position. It makes no sense to me. What you want, what you need for an economy to be healthy, vibrant, and right now, in the case of the United States, to really embark on structural reforms is you need a strong dollar. You need savings. Savings and investment are what drive economic growth that provide opportunity and prosperity. Not a weaker currency. You want a weaker currency? Go to Venezuela. Go to Zimbabwe. I mean, if it was that simple, if that was the recipe that a central bank, that a federal government, all they have to do is print money, then Venezuela would be the wealthiest nation on the planet, or Zimbabwe would be the wealthiest nation on the planet. That's not how it works, ladies and gentlemen. Because even if we were to manipulate our currency, which the president rails against everybody else, but allegedly or supposedly, if we do it, it's perfectly fine. Again, poor leadership. Poor leadership and poor decision-making on that one. But uh, apparently, it's okay if we do it. Th th I'm beside myself with this because... Just the other day, on Friday, we talked about this. The president was asked a question in the Oval Office about the strength of the dollar. And he sort of said, well, you know what? Look, he backed away. It was sort of a softball for him to say what he's saying on these tweets. Yeah, I want it to be lower. Go ahead and do it. He said, well, you know, the economy here in the U.S. is strong, and that, you know, associates with a strong dollar. So, I mean, it's kind of a good thing. Now, again, he's doing a 180. That's why his credibility is in question with me. It's a serious thing. It's a serious point with me. So I don't know where the president stands, what he really wants. Does he know what he really wants? Because if he has a weaker dollar, is he going to have an increase in energy costs? Because is the president then going to come out and yell at OPEC to get the supply up so the prices can come down? Does he understand the intricacies of all of this? I believe he probably has some understanding, but this isn't rocket science either. I just think it's a huge disservice to the American people to say that he wants a weaker dollar because the other thing that's going to happen is other central banks and other federal governments are going to lower their currency or going to try to manipulate their currency even lower as well. So again, this is a currency war. This is a race to the bottom. It's not a one-off. Currencies trade relative to one another. So if we cut interest rates, well, the ECB, the European Central Bank, is going to cut interest rates. The PBOC, the People's Bank of China, they're going to cut their interest rates. They'll embark on quantitative easing. The Bank of Japan will do it. The Reserve Bank of Australia will do it. The Bank of Canada will do it. The Bank of England will do it. You see what I'm saying? This isn't a one-off. If you want a strong economy, you need a strong currency. The other thing that the president mentions, he said it was in relation to debt. So what he's saying there is we have a lot of debt in this country. He's, he's, he's sort of acknowledging the fact. Of course, he's done nothing to make it any better. In fact, he's made it rather worse, quite worse. If you thought Obama was bad, Donald Trump isn't making it any better. Hate to break it to you, but fiscal conservatives out there, you're non-existent because this is your guy. You voted for Donald Trump so he can get away with anything he wants. That's exactly why we have $23 trillion in debt. Obama's my guy. I, he can do whatever he wants. Trump's my guy. He can do whatever he wants. And back and forth we go. $23 trillion in debt. That's what you get. That's what you deserve. I don't deserve it. I don't want it. But I'm going to have to pay for it, aren't I? Don't go in your silo. Don't get in your bubble. Somebody makes a mistake, call them out on it. I didn't vote for Donald Trump to increase the national debt, especially not to the degree that he has, with no end in sight. And now he's calling basically on the Federal Reserve to monetize the debt away, as opposed to being a leader and saying, we got to get together and get our house in order. We got to cut spending. We got to do a whole slew of things to get our house in order, just like you would have to do personally with your finances. 
You can't just tap the bank and just keep going back to the bank. Eventually, they're not going to give you any money. You don't have a printing press. If you did and you get caught, they're going to lock you up and throw away the key. So I advise you not to do so. But the government, the Federal Reserve, they facilitate one another. The Federal Reserve loves printing money because they get to have real assets with it. They get to, they get to print counterfeit money and then they get to have real assets with it. What a deal that is. What a deal that would be. That's exactly like if you were to print money, completely counterfeit, but went out into the marketplace and bought real assets with it. Man, you'd be rich, wouldn't you? You'd be really, really wealthy. You're starting to get the picture of how this game is played. And no politician, Republican, Democrat, the president himself, nobody wants to look the American people in the eye and say, we got a problem. And here's how we're going to fix it. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick, but it needs to be done. Nope. Let's just print more money. Let's just monetize the debt. Let's give the Federal Reserve more power. Let's give them access to more assets. Does this make sense to you? Does this sound like free market capitalism to you? Because it's not. It's not even close. But this is the game that we're playing. This is why we put together that video presentation. That's why we're going to put together more in the future. Are central banks trapped? And now we have zero hour for central banks because this is a key week in what is likely to transpire over the course of the next year into and probably even longer than that until all hell breaks loose because these guys don't know what they're doing. They are shooting from the hip, which is most evidenced by the graphs and the presentation that we put together. And you're going to see it. As soon as you see these graphs, you're going to say, this doesn't make any sense. I'm not an economist. I'm not a financial analyst. I've never seen this balance sheet before in my life. I've heard of quantitative easing. I've heard of quantitative tightening. I've heard of negative interest rates. I've heard of zero interest rates, but I've never seen it graphically before. You're going to see this and you're going to say, this doesn't make any sense. And you'd be exactly right. Because now, ladies and gentlemen, we've done podcasts focusing on negative interest rates. And we said only a couple months ago, it was about $10 trillion. Then very shortly thereafter, because I meant to get to that podcast, time had passed by and it was closer to $12 trillion. Now it's nearing $14 trillion in global yields, negative yields, I should say. Four, near, nearly $14 trillion in negative yielding bonds. That's government bonds and corporate bonds. You have some junk bonds, euro-denominated, with a negative yield. What could go wrong? Stay tuned and find out. This is the Capital News. I am Alex Kreitis. Godspeed.